I'm here with Gabe Draper, co-founder of Factor. How you doing, sir? Good, man. Thanks for having me. Good to see you, man. It's been a, it's been a little bit. I mean, we we run into each other at the gym here and there, but yep. uh, you know, we went uh, our separate ways with the old co-working space we used to work at where we met. I think you actually obviously know Nathan and Weston as mm-hmm. well. And good to have you back, man. I appreciate you joining me on the podcast. Great, good to be here. Well, cool. So you've you've done these before, right? And uh, Couple, obviously, yeah. you're you're considering doing some podcasting of your own. But uh, today, I want to focus on your life as an entrepreneur uh, with Factor and Constructor as well. Uh, but before we get into all that fun stuff, like learn a little bit about you. Who are you? Uh, your background, those sorts of things, man. So, so tell us about yourself. So, uh, yeah, grew up in Indiana, uh, corn-fed boy from Indianapolis. Uh-huh. Uh, always had the entrepreneurial itch. Uh, I don't know, you call it uh, nonconformist or whatnot. Like school was a struggle. Following the rules that, you know, some early jobs yeah. were a struggle. Obeying orders that didn't make sense to me was a struggle. Um, so I kind of, at an early age, probably 13 or 14, realized, like, all right, I want to have my own business someday. Uh, so went to Baylor University for college, studied entrepreneurship. Uh, we started a few kind of pr- play businesses, mm-hmm. little little things that didn't go anywhere. Like and, while you were in college? You while we were that? in college, yeah. 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 Well, that's the time to do it, right? When there's less responsibility, right? You're not obviously paying yeah. mortgages and taking care of kids at that time. So yeah. what kind of businesses did you play around with? We started, a, and it, we called it uncharted advertising. Uh, it was advertising in unusual spots. Okay. So like over a urinal in a restroom or like the <laughs> counter at a retail location and things like that. Uh, we did that as a, as a group project for our entrepreneurial class uh, or one of our entrepreneurship classes. Uh, didn't really go anywhere. I mean, it was a fun project. Then we started another a catering company uh, with some buddies from. I was waiting tables to put myself through college, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so some buddies from uh, from the restaurant. We started a catering company that didn't really go anywhere. <laughs> uh, I uh, started a company buying and selling devices, like the old school TI eighty six calculators oh, yeah. that everybody yeah. would spend you know one hundred fifty bucks on and then chuck it at the end of the semester. Yeah, I would buy those for like you know twenty five percent and then resell it for seventy five percent. Um, just fun little stuff. Uh, so yeah, studied entrepreneurship, uh, then kind of went into a family business up in Indiana, back up in Indiana okay. with my dad and grandfather. They had started it while I was in college and it was a contract manufacturing business okay. called Draper manufacturing. Uh, and basically they started, they actually started building floating boat docks and that didn't go well. So they, uh, they had this equipment to make the boat docks. And so because they didn't have the revenue they needed, they started doing contract manufacturing for other companies and that was going a lot better. So by the time I came in the business, it was, I don't know, five or six years old and they'd gotten out of the, the boat dock business and they were full on contract manufacturing, specifically machining. Okay. So they did CNC machining where you and basically, what were you doing for them? Or when you come out of college, what did they hire you to do right out of the gate? Uh, I think my title was like plant manager. It was small. I mean, we had maybe six or seven people. Okay. Okay. Um, so my role was plant manager, basically to m- manage the, uh, the shop operations. So mm-hmm. buying material, production schedules, managing the people, making sure they're showing up on time, quality, shipping, uh, all that stuff. Well, we were joking off the podcast. I'd love to hear you weigh in on this because you, you studied entrepreneurship and I don't know if we'll include what we were talking about right before I introduced you that, you know, you, you probably should have skipped the entrepreneurship classes and just gone <laughs> on to business it yourself. But like, do you feel like looking backwards retrospectively, was it worth it to go study that stuff? What did it help you? Or do you think you may have been better off just skipping and going straight into building a business or two? So it's, it's two sides. One, I had a blast and I met my wife there. So the college experience was great. Sure. Sure. The other side is, you know, the intended purpose of college is to get knowledge into your brain and go do something with it after college. Mm -hmm. That was a total scam. Okay. (laughs) For for the money, like, you know, colleges are teaching old information because the rate of information that flows through YouTube a thousand times faster than it flows through a university. So you're getting old information in college. So some degrees, that's the only way to get it. But for entrepreneurship, for, I don't know, $100,000, $150,000 in four years of my life, like, I should have just taken that and started a painting company or landscaping or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the lessons and the, the, the ramp up would have been 
a lot faster. Well, I want to agree with you. There's there's certain industries like if you're going to be a doctor, of course you got to go to school, right? Or there's an engineer, you have to prove you know certain things and test for them. Otherwise, nobody's going to let you build a bridge. Like mm-hmm. we don't want people that watched YouTube videos going to build bridges. Or at least maybe maybe I don't know, maybe yet. we just need to have a good certification process. And there you go. Maybe maybe we should have a YouTube bridge building yeah. certification yeah. process. But then things like I studied business administration and I had an exercise science degree as well. Some of that was relevant. Some of it, like you said, not so much. I mean, I think I look back at some of the nutritional information I learned was so outdated versus what I know today that I mm-hmm. just learned by trial and error and, and continuing to look. I think you're right. There's certain things that you're better off maybe just bypassing college and all together and just finding a way to learn on the job. Totally. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's still some things I look back at that, that I did take from the college experience. I met my wife there too as well. So that wouldn't have happened. But so flash me forward. Now you're working with a family business, your plant manager, um, did you basically shed all of your com- previous knowledge and theory in, in college and then just have to start over? Or uh, did you feel like you're able to hit the ground running? Uh, I think at that time, uh, ignorance and confidence were at all time high. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't know what I didn't know. But uh, yeah, I came into the business and it, it wasn't going great. Uh, my dad and grandfather were having some health issues, okay. which was affecting the business. Uh, so, and we frankly, you know, when you're in a family business and things aren't going well, it creates a lot of stress. So we had a lot of conflict between the three of us. Uh, So at some point, you know, a year or two after coming into the business, it kind of came to a head where it's like, we can't all work together. So somebody has got to run this thing. The other guys have to go do something. So uh, because their health issues and whatnot, it made sense for me to run it. So we came up with an agreement for me to buy them out. Uh, We were losing, we were doing like $400,000 in revenue and losing 125. Annually so like, or, or? Yeah, annually. Okay. Yep. So, like, that's not good. Yeah. Uh, so, negative cash flow, somehow I bought them out uh, using the cash flow of the business, which, you know, if you got negative cash, it's like, how did that work? <laughs> uh, you know, what's the math like? That? Yeah. Work out on that. Um, so, anyway, we we, we, uh, we came up with this agreement. Uh, grandfather retired. Dad went to work at Rolls-Royce, which is a really good fit for him. They still retained a little bit of ownership in the business. I paid them out over a few years. We were able to get the business profitable and scale it. I don't know. We got up to like three, three and a half million bucks in revenue okay. and uh, pretty, pretty profitable. We were like 14% net income, which is pretty good for a machine shop. It's, it's very, uh, it's a very cutthroat business. Okay. So we were doing pretty well for a while. The problem was I, I was able to do that really riding the wave of oil and gas. Ah, so what time frame was this? When was this? This was, uh, so I, I came into the business 2006. I bought it, I think 2008 or nine, uh, and then struggled for a few years. I think we started to hit our stride in 2012, had a few good years. Uh, 2014, the price of oil went down Okay. and basically overnight, all the orders dried up No. like kidding. within a month. Because were you doing machining for oil rigs and yeah, so fields or what? Like what were we doing? This podcast is brought to you by True Captive Insurance, a premier medical stop loss captive for employer groups ranging from twenty five to a thousand employees. True Captive believes in healthcare that is personal and insurance that isn't complicated. That's why they take a white glove approach, making it easy for employer groups to transition into a program built specifically for them. Check them out at True Captive. The main thing we were doing, Halliburton was primarily, was my biggest customer. And we were making these, uh, it's a charge cage. It's basically a little bombshell. Okay. Um, it's a, it's a metal cup okay. that they pack full of explosives. They put it in this tube called a perforation gun. When they're, when they're drilling a well, they drill it, they put a case in there, they cement around the case and then they go down the, when they want to, uh, frack, yep. they have to perforate these casings. So these little bombshells basically blow Span holes out. into yeah, the yeah. casing and into the rock. Then they put uh, a manifold on top, tons of pressure. It, it opens up the cracks, uh, fractures the cracks, hence fracking. Fracking, yep. Uh, then they pump basically like a sandy water down into the cracks. The sand goes into the cracks. When the pressure goes away, the sand holds open the cracks. And so your your surface area is like exponentially greater. Okay. So that's, that's why fracking is really economically viable because – it just increases the production of a well. So anyway, obviously fracking uh, was was booming and still is to some degree. But uh, for a machine shop, they they order parts in high quantities. They don't care about price. They only care about delivery. They blow them up and then they want more. Okay. And like it's not about like 
like where we weren't quoting on price. It was basically like, how quickly can you get those to me? So it's just speed, speed. So speed, okay. yeah. So then were you, when the oil, price of oil dropped, what did that mean specifically to your business that all of a sudden now, you said the orders dried up. Yeah. And then are you sitting on a bunch of inventory then at that point or, or what was the challenge? Now, there? They, uh, well, I mean, we were, they were, they were good. Halliburton in particular was, was pretty fair, even though they put us out of business, they honored all their purchase orders. They took all the inventory. They paid us like a, an unscrupulous customer could have just, you know, walked yeah. and it's like, sue us, we're Halliburton, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. didn't do that. So they were fair to me. Um, but that overnight, basically that shut down your business? Pretty much. It was okay. 72% of my revenue. Okay. The other 28%, we were working on diversifying because it's like, there's a, uh, you know, a boneyard of companies that have gone out of business riding the oil and gas waves. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not a secret that that happens. Uh, the, the big thing was when I bought it, we didn't have the revenue to, be, to cover our overhead to be profitable. So the, you know, the tiger that was chasing me was profitability. Mm -hmm. um, so we needed volume to get that. So we got that in oil and gas. The second tiger behind the first tiger was diversifying away from oil and gas. Okay. And we were, you know, running pretty fast away from that tiger, but it caught up to us. So 72% of my revenue basically went away in a month. Jeez. And, you know, I, I had worked eight, nine years really grinding. I mean, I had, a, I had a, a inflatable mattress in my office. Like when we couldn't afford automation to run at night, we, we would just stay there and like load the machines Dang. manual. I had an alarm I'd set every hour and a half. I'd get up, go out in there, put material in the machine, go back, set the alarm again. I mean, it was, it was nuts. So I had, I had really, um, so you think, I think you did that before Elon Musk did it before it was cool to sleep in your office and have it. I remember there's like famously people joke about him, like having a couch in his office and, and basically working 20 hours a day. And you were doing that because you had to, but so, so not for effort, right? Effort wasn't the issue. It was, uh, you couldn't diversify fast enough. So, yep. so, so what ultimately was when you, you look up and go, I got to turn the lights off. Like, was there a day that you knew it was, was kind of over at that point or what? Yeah, I mean, when you're when seventy two percent of your revenue goes yeah. away, like, but was it that day, or did you think you might be able to dig yourself out of it? You know, if you could diversify. I think fast I took enough? a week or two to like th think through, like, what could we do? Yeah, but because I had spent so much time and energy, I didn't have the. Maybe we could have like gone back and shrunk down and started over, but like I was, I was zapped. Like the contract manufacturing is really tough. Machining is like the toughest of the tough, and like I was just zapped. And I, had, you know, my son. Uh, was on the way at that point, and I was like, I don't have the energy to rebuild this business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe we could have done that, but maybe after a few weeks, I, I, I looked, saw what could, what else could we do? Talk to some customers. Do you have anything that could make up for this? It, it, and it was pretty clear it, there was no, there were no good options that I wanted to pursue. So, yeah, we made the decision. Um, told all our guys, hey, give us your resume. I put them in a zip drive. Sent them to a bunch of my buddies. Um, the blessing was, I think they all got jobs right away. I yeah. don't know if anybody missed a paycheck. That's awesome. So it, yeah, that was really fortunate. Um, and then on the other side of this, so you, you shared the story before and I want to make sure I'm, I'm connecting the dot. Is this when you went through a bankruptcy? Um, is that this from the result of the, the business or was that a separate story? Yeah. Yeah, totally. No, it was definitely that. Okay. So so, tell, so financially, right, like you, you rode this wave, right, and you guys were doing pretty well. You took over the business. You had it stabilized. You grew the revenue. You were somewhat profitable, but like you said, there's a couple tigers chasing you. One of them got gotcha. So walk me through now the sunsetting of a business and going through that. Like what's that like emotionally, and then what's that like from, you know, just an economic standpoint trying to dig yourself out of a, a hole like that? Uh, during it, it wasn't fun. I mean, it was kind of the worst nightmare mm -hmm. situation, like, when you're trying to start a business, you're always kind of worried, like, what if I fail? Yeah. For a bunch of reasons, financially, you know, your ego, your future, what are people going to think of me? You know, all that stuff. Uh, going through it was not fun. So, you know, it was hard to tell everybody, hey, you don't have a job anymore. Uh, it was hard to tell investors, hey, we're shutting down. You're not getting any return on your mm -hmm. money. You're mm -hmm. not getting more return on your money. Uh, it was hard to go to all of our vendors and stuff, say, hey, we're shutting down. And I can't pay you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can give you X if you'll cancel the rest. And so we went through that. I think we uh, decided to shut down in March of 2015. Uh, and then we had about six months where we were winding down, finishing out orders, selling off some equipment. We had an auction in August. 
uh, where that was kind of like the, the last uh, nail in the coffin of the business. So once all the equipment was sold and gone, you know, gave the keys back to the landlord and, and we were done at that point. Um, so yeah, it was gut wrenching. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, my income got turned off right away. Yeah. Uh, we ended up selling our house just to stay afloat. Yep. Uh, so we used the cash from, from selling our house to pay the bills. Uh, we had to take out loans on our cars to pay the bills. Uh, so you owned your cars at the time and then just yeah. refinance them basically. Yeah, yeah. So we went to the bank and there was a moment I'll never forget sitting at the bank. My wife's pregnant, like really pregnant. And she's sitting there at the te- at the desk, like crying her eyes out, signing yeah, some loan documents. And like, yeah, that was probably the worst of it. Uh, but still, still got her. So yeah. she, uh, well, I was gonna she say, stuck like, around. I was going to say the one amazing for, 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 you know, that the lowest of the low, right. Of, of y'all's lives, right. To, to band together. I'm sure this sort of reinforced the commitment that you had for each other. Obviously you got a child on the way. Um, so it's like, there is no choice, but to pick ourselves up from that. So, I mean, that's, that's amazing. But like, as you're going through that, all of the, you know, it's, I'm sure it's like almost like the loss of a, a loved one, right. Or, you know, just the emotional journey, going through the different stages of loss and all those things. But then you get these loans, you get your bills paid off, you have to mortgage the house. What, so what do you, where do you go next? Like, what's the next step? Did you have an idea of what you wanted to do next? I mean, cause you're probably at a point where I like, I got to figure something out. Right. Like, and right away. So what did you end up doing? Like, what was the next step for you? So yeah, it was a big question mark. Uh, I think my son was born, he's born July 18th. I think we had our auction on like August 8th or something like that. So you know, I was, had this newborn come in. We were mm-hmm. going to sell our house, moving into like a, not a studio, but almost a studio apartment. So it was kind of like, what am I going to do? I mean, we had some cash from the house and the, the cars and stuff, uh, but no income. Yeah. Uh, so I had 12 things. A few were jobs. I had a couple businesses I was looking at buying, but I didn't have any money. Um, and uh, a buddy of mine, Caleb, we uh, we met at our church in our, our uh, life group. And uh, so we were buddies. He was in the, in the industry and uh, a few years prior to me going out of business, we had started this thing we called the Manufacturers Referral Network. Okay. Basically just like structured networking for industrial salespeople. So we had started that. We were charging some money for it. It was, I don't know, we were like 20 to 40 grand a year in revenue. So it was like, it wasn't livable, mm-hmm. but it was like something. Something, yeah, yeah. So when we were winding down, I had more time on my hands. So I just focused on that, interviewed, tried to figure out what was next. Uh, and during that time frame, that shot up. I think we got it up to, I don't know. I don't remember what it was, maybe a hundred grand a year by the end of, uh, 2015. So it, you know, it was on a good path. And I was like, all the other stuff fell off. The interviews didn't go well. Um, some of the things I was chasing didn't go anywhere. So by the end of 2015, it was like, all right, this is what I'm doing. I'm just going to focus on this. Could, did you, because you recognize the opportunity or because it was already sort of in motion and you felt like you could, you could pick it up and intensively focus on it and build it to be something bigger. Like what was it about that decision of that thing, uh, that you thought you could, you take a hold of and, and pursue. Yeah. It wasn't really any grandiose thought. It was more like cash flow. Cash flow. Like, I've, dude, I've yeah. talked to a lot of entrepreneurs, like I was telling you, and sometimes it's like you have this amazing, innovative idea. You have this epiphany. I've had one guy call it his flux capacitor moment. And then sometimes it's like, well, this thing was working and I figured I could go do it. And that, it was like, that. that's literally the decision-making process that happened. I like to reinforce that though. It doesn't always have to be this sexy idea. It doesn't have to be this like hyper innovative thing. Sometimes things just work and you feel like you can do it and you just make a decision. And oftentimes I feel like hearing from other people is just, I just made a decision Mm -hmm. and that's all I needed to do. We just make the decision now to go do it. So you pick this thing up. You you obviously made this referral network bigger because you had time to focus on it. Did it morph over time into what eventually would be factor or, or was, is, is that the, what the predecessor was to, to factor? This podcast is sponsored by PlanSight. PlanSight is a technology for employee benefits brokers to more efficiently manage their RFP process for any group size, all funding types, and over 20 benefit lines and point solutions. PlanSight is the only end-to-end RFP technology on the market today. Let's modernize your RFP process together. Check us out at PlanSight.com. Yeah, so uh, MRN originally was our brand. Uh, 2016, Caleb jumped on board full-time. Uh, and we quick, quickly realized that our business wasn't scalable. Uh, so, you know, we had another kind of, what are we going to do kind of moment. We listed out a whole bunch of stuff we thought we could do. Uh, we basically, our, our R&D process was 
let's pray over this list and ask God what, like, where, what should we do with our, our talents and our, our, our time? Uh, and then let's just talk to people and, like, try to sell it. And so most of the stuff, like, didn't go anywhere. But we had this one, which was basically what we, we still do today, outsource prospecting, mm-hmm. where basically we just hunt for customers on contract for other okay. shops. Okay. So I think within a month we had four people willing to pay us a retainer to basically make cold calls for okay. their business. Were you a natural or did you have a skill set at cold calling? I mean, I'd done it a lot for my shop. Okay. And K- Caleb's a pro salesman. So like he was a, he was a pro and I was a novice. Uh, but again, like ne- necessity is the mother of oh, invention. Hey, absolutely, man. Yeah. And like we had a tiger chase and it's like we, would, we didn't have enough money coming in to, to pay our bills. So we were down. We were like, hey, let's figure it out. So we got super scrappy. Uh, it, we started out literally going to the library and buying free data from the library and that you can only export like 200 records at a time. And there's like, now we have like 20 million records. So yeah, like, yeah. you know, 200 at a time, that's not really realistic, but anyway, we're super scrappy going there. Then the, the data at the library is like not good. It's like, <laughs> I, I, the library wouldn't be my first place. Yeah. To go mine it's like, leads you know, from, yeah. the restaurant sends their, you know, week old bread to the soup kitchens. Like it's the soup kitchen okay. bread. Okay. Cause it's, it's old and stale. Anyway, we took that. But did you generate any business out of those uh, oh, yeah, yeah. library leads? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, bad data is kind of like bad gas. It's like it might still run, but yeah. it's inefficient. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, we just got scrappy. We were just making making tons and tons of cold calls. Uh, and that, that worked. And then, you know, over time we got better data. Uh, we got super efficient. And uh, with our processes, we got really awesome technology. Okay. that's like kind of next level stuff. Uh, and we've just really scaled it from there. So yeah, we started with outsource prospecting. It was just Caleb and I, I think until 20, 2016 and 2017, I believe. Uh, and then we met uh, our first guy and actually in, in a, he's a, he's a Serbian living in, I think at the time he was living in Belgium. Uh, but we met him online randomly to do a, like a technical research project. Okay. So he was our first employee. Um, and we've scaled up from there. Now we've got, I don't know, 65, 70 people between Dallas, Indianapolis and, uh, Serbia. When did you, when did you move to Texas? So 2017, 2017. And yes. what was the reason for that move then? For uh, my, my wife's family's here in Plano, uh, we had always wanted to move back. I mean, you know, Texas is great. So we'd always wanted to move back. When I had my shop, I couldn't move back uh, for a bunch of reasons. After I went out of business, we were just, you know, wiped out financially. I had like half a million bucks in debt. Uh, so for a few years, it was like not, we were like flopping like a fish on a dock financially. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. didn't actually file bankruptcy, but we were like flat broke. We were bankrupt effectively. Uh, so it took a few years to heal up financially where yeah. we could actually afford to leave. It's a big hole, man. Yeah. So 2017, we, we felt like we could do it. So we just kind of pulled the trigger and, and moved to Frisco. Nice, man. Well, so, so let's, uh, this is, feels like a good uh, segue into factor the business. We, we've talked about it. We've used, obviously, the nomenclature and then constructor I want to hear about as well. But why don't you just explain fully what factor is, who you serve, those uh, types of things. So the, the, the brand factor is the middle of the word manufacturing. So... All, our customer base is made up of what we call industrial suppliers. So there's all these OEMs that make the products that we all use. And then we usually know the, the, the brands that make those, Ford, GM, Pfizer, all these well-known brands. Uh, they all have a supplier base. That supplier base is our customer base. Okay. We help them get into more logos uh, more OEMs, more manufacturers. So you're using an example of like a plastic manufacturing company that's down the road that I'm, you know, probably haven't seen the building, but like you said, I might notice it now that you mention it. So that type of entity that may not, that's not a household name, but obviously manufacturers for a supply chain upwards for a brand name, like a Kellogg's or a mm-hmm. Ford or something. So those people are really your customer base. Yep. And so what is the value that you now are bringing to those people? Our mission as a company is to help them grow. So we do that by helping them find new customers, diversifying their customer and industry base, and getting a more profitable mix of work. Most of these suppliers are founded, owned, and run by engineers. Okay. And they're brilliant. They're awesome people. It's super fun working with them. Most of the time, not always, 
sales and marketing is not their deal. Yeah. Like that's not what they're wired to do. So we, we created services where we can just bolt onto their business as a part of their team. We're just already up and running. We, we can get up and going quick and produce results quicker, more effectively and bigger than, than most of them could do then themselves. If they either do themselves or bring an in her in-house salesperson. Yeah. Right. So, so you're saying typically speaking, they're not, what do you say proficient or they're not focused on sales and marketing, right? So have they just been able to build businesses then through word of mouth, connections, referrals, but never had any actual outbound sales efforts? Totally. Okay. Yeah. All those things you mentioned are reactive strategies yeah. Yeah. and that works up to a point. Yeah. yeah. And then it doesn't work anymore. And you either have to decide to just stay where you're at or you got to be proactive. And so you're offering them turnkey sales and lead generation, right? You're, you're able to stand it up quickly. You guys have the expertise, right? So this is, this is your niche. Mm -hmm. This manufacturing supply chain niche is all you do with factor, correct? Yep. Okay. So then how, how did you guys over time realize that you developed enough skills that you thought you could build teams to sell on behalf of any of these people down that supply chain? Was it over time you just figured, Hey, we really know this well and we know how to do it. Or was there certain kind of increments that you got to where you go, Oh, Oh wow, we can do this now. And I think we can do this. Like talk to me about kind of the evolutionary process from that referral business where you started to, to what it is today. So yeah, it was an iterative process. We had to learn each client's business, you know, what they do, how they do it, how they're different. You know, there's a lot of technical stuff we have to learn uh, so that we can find right opportunities. Cause all these companies are niche in what mm -hmm. they do. They can't do, they're not all things, to all people. So we have to, become technically proficient on their business. Now we're not the technical experts. We're not the engineers, uh, but we, we educate ourselves on the client's business well enough to hunt for, for customers and for opportunities. Okay. And we pull them in when it, when we get over our skis with the technical knowledge. So, so you bring them a lead or a warm prospect or somebody that's really interested. And then you pull in the business owner or that business and say, all right, you need to be involved in the closing of the sale. Mm -hmm. So to, is the, the prospect aware that you're not, that's your factor or is fact factor white labeled within where it looks like you're just a salesperson for this company. Yeah. We white label everything. Okay. Uh, most of the time they're not aware if they ask, we'll be honest about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we, we try very hard to not only look like a part of the client's team, but to act like it. Okay. So uh, many of our clients say you're our sales team. Like we, they don't, because they're, we're, you know, 1099 versus W2, like, the, the paperwork doesn't matter. We act like we're part of their sales team. Okay. So then technically what sort of processes are, you know, lead generation is the most obvious, right? So you guys are cold calling, um, sourcing leads from some of the tech technical stuff. Cause I mean, you're, you're kind of a tech company, right? Uh, in a sense, I think you were telling me some of the inner workings with, you've got that team over in Serbia. So did you build your own technology or what, what are you using to sort of manage the pipeline and things like that? Yeah. Up until this year, we, we kind of, hacked together a Frankenstein machine of our, you know, like most people call it their tech stack. Yeah. We have way overused that. Uh, we have I don't know, a countless number of systems that we've hacked together and okay. it works super well. Okay. Uh, this year we're developing our own technology okay. where it'll cool. replace a lot of that. So that'll allow us to operate a lot more efficiently. It'll allow us to, to offer things that, we aren't offering and nobody's offering mm -hmm. to our clients. So it's really going to elevate. It's going to be kind of factor 2.0 cool. uh, next year when we come out with it. Well, so factor 2.0. So tell me kind of where the business is today. And I also would love if we can spend a couple minutes after that, kind of how your business morphed over the last few years, um, you know, selling through COVID. But so kind of give me present state of the union of factor. You mentioned about 65, 70 employees, three locations. Um, you know, business obviously is healthy, is growing. Tell me kind of where you are present day, um, you know, just current state. Yeah. So our, we, uh, yeah, as you said, we have, I don't know, 65, 70 people between our three locations. Uh, so our services, we have our lead generation mm -hmm. where if you've got salespeople uh, or if the owner or senior manager wants to manage the sales process, we can generate leads for them, kind of get the foot in the door at some of these companies, but they do the sales process. Uh, then uh, we have lead gener or we have a appointment setting. So we can take it a step further and actually set that first appointment for them. Uh, and then we have our full service, which is about, you know, it's the majority of what we do, which we call outsource prospecting. Uh, and so it's full funnel. We take it all the way up to that first qualified quote. Okay. 
Um, and we qualify all the technical things like quantities, materials, uh, sizes, all, all the stuff that would indicate whether or not it's a good fit. And then we pass off to the client. They quote it. They close it. They, they take and manage that customer. Uh, and then we last year we got into salesperson recruiting and placement. So a lot of people, uh, there, there's been a lot of uh, turnover with salespeople sure. in the industrial space. Sure. Uh, so we bring a methodology where we can help reduce the risk of sales hires and help place people and set them up for success so that they can drive revenue being on the client's payroll where it might not make oh, okay. sense. So, so is, was there just a recognition that at a certain point their needs are so great that they actually do need somebody in-house instead? We're on a mission to partner with the most innovative companies in America to fix health benefits one plan at a time. NavMD has created a blueprint that delivers world-class benefits to 155 million Americans. Better benefits starts with data intelligence. Our platform is empowering the next generation of advisors to zero in on opportunities to optimize the plan, build the right team, implement proven strategies and solutions. Join us on our journey to revolutionize health benefits. Let NavMD put you a step ahead. Some some companies either want to have everything done in-house or if it's a really long relational sales cycle, mm, they yeah. need to be on your, the client's payroll, not ours. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes if it's really complicated technical process with tons of meetings and revisions and engineering, they need to be on the, their payroll. We're not going to ha have the expertise to do that. So in those cases, we'll place salespeople on their team and we can support them with lead generation or appointment setting. But the so you can still support that salesperson, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, but is that, is that maybe a business almost kind of outgrows the need for outsourcing at that point? Or is it just because of the technicality of the sale itself that, that makes that need stronger than outsourcing? Uh, it's situational. Okay. Uh, I mean, we have multi-billion dollar global companies in our full service. So they don't necessarily outgrow it from a company size. I see. Um, and we also have, you know, small mom and pops in, in our service as well. So it kind of covers the range. It's really situational on what they need, what they prefer. When it, every business I know has been impacted in one way, shape or form by the pandemic, we actually met during, I think 2020 or 20, probably 2021, I guess, um, when it felt like we were kind of coming out of it. But so how did this impact your business? Um, you know, whether from operation standpoint, you know, was there differences in revenue? I'd like to hear just kind of the general um, challenges that you faced during that time. Uh, it was good for us. It was. Okay. Yeah. We, yeah. uh, we took the attitude that we weren't going to pull back, uh, as we call it default aggressive. So we didn't really change. we were still in the office. We gave our people the choice, you know, do what you feel is best, but most people came in. Yeah. Uh, we were still traveling. Everybody said you couldn't travel. We're like, we're traveling every week. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and our clients didn't want to take the foot off the gas, but they also didn't know how to operate. So, uh, we, I think we tripled our revenue in 2020. Um, because there was such demand for people to continue to grow, but not really knowing how to navigate what was going on. Yeah. Uh, so it was good for us then. And last year, uh, we grew, I think we doubled, not quite doubled our revenue last year again. So, uh, it was good for us. Uh, I mean, a lot of people are suffering, so it was kind of bittersweet. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our business, a lot of our clients were, their business was not doing great, which is why they came to us. Uh, so it was bittersweet. We, we tried not to we tried to celebrate inwardly, not necessarily outwardly. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I've talked about this on a number of occasions on this podcast. I mean, my company benefited, um, you know, if you want to just look at it factually, benefited from the, the pandemic and the shutdowns. I'm in an industry where most of our jobs can be done virtually anyways, um, different than a manufacturing company that has physical supplies mm -hmm. and somebody needs to be in there machining them. Like we were, it's all intellectual property and, you know, documents and things like that. And then a lot of my sales processes is over Zooms because it's, it's um, you know, software. So we benefited just by nature of now, like if everybody dispersed and went home, but you still have all these teams that have to operate as a business, so you got to have something to connect them. And so our software was doing that. So it is bittersweet that we benefited from it. But it also, I think you hear in financial services and insurance and stuff, everybody has this debate going on right now. Should we or shouldn't we go back to the office or what's the future of work going to look like? Some businesses never had that choice. And I think that gets lost often. You know, if you go to a restaurant or you go to a car mechanic or whatever, somebody's 
got to physically be there. Mm-hmm. They don't have the choice to stay home. And I think that gets lost a lot in the shuffle. So it's not surprising from my, you know, where I sit that uh, you guys were able to grow during that time because those manufacturing plants weren't, weren't shutting yeah. down. Right. Okay. So then when, when was the spinoff of constructor? Like, or was that during that time or has, has that always existed? Tell me, tell me about how that differs from what you do at factor. Yeah, we started constructor, uh, 2021, okay. uh, early 2021. And uh, a buddy of mine also, you know, I don't know, maybe you meet people at church. Maybe they, maybe that's where you meet good business partners. Yeah, sounds like uh, it. We were in a men's group uh, in McKinney at a at a church. And uh, Rob was a good buddy, and he had already kind of proven himself several times starting and selling businesses. Uh, so he was wrapping up a business, and he's got young kids now. He didn't really have the, the energy to put all it takes to start a new business from the ground up into it. So we were talking and, uh, we had already had a little bit of our revenue, uh, with industrially focused construction companies. And, uh, so we knew it was working. So we'd already proven out the business model. He'd already proven himself as a, as an entrepreneur. So we said, Hey, we could throw some money in together, uh, and set up a new entity. You could take our business model, carbon copy it for commercial construction and facilities maintenance. Okay. And so we did that early last year and it's gone great. Sweet. So he's built out an awesome team. I think they've got, I don't know, 10 or 12 people and they're up over a couple million bucks in revenue already and uh, just crushing it. I think they, they won a deal a couple weeks ago. It was like 220 million bucks. So like big, like they're, they're crushing it for, for their clients. So we don't, uh, Caleb and I don't have any day to day involvement in that. Uh, you know, we helped start it we're owners in it, but Rob and his team really run it and it's going great so far. Well, so that's what, that's what I got curious about it because I even like the, the, the naming convention, how you spell constructor versus factor. <laughs> it's like, a, there's a theme, but I'm wondering, like, did that prove the concept to you that this was repeatable, right? This was carbon copyable, I think is a term you use that this could possibly be replicated in other industries as well. This model. It could be. Okay. That's not our model. Okay. N- never say never. We were really opportunistic with Rob in particular, and because we'd already proven out the, the business with these this handful of customers. Mm-hmm. So it seemed like a no-brainer, okay. like low risk. Well, I was joking with you when I was coming up with the uh, the, the notes. I don't know if you noticed the question about, could I do this for podcaster? Yeah, I, oh, yeah. I'll spell it the same way, <laughs> and then we'll do the same model for podcasting. You never know. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, all joking aside, kind of the future of, of your business, right? Obviously, things are going well, but you have – I was kind of asking you what your long-term goals are off camera, and you shared with me a little bit of your vision there. But it sounds like your vision is to grow this thing to be a massive global company. So talk, talk to me about the long-term play of what you're trying to do here. So we want to be a hundred year company that outlasts all of us. And we want to build it in a way that it lasts and that it benefits, benefits future employees, future families, future clients. Uh, the, the manufacturing supply base is global. Very few people are focused on helping these types of companies and there's a huge need. So we aspire to be a global company that helps every single supplier out there that needs help growing their business. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't see any reason why we can't other than, we just don't rise to the occasion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you tell me you want to, you want to do this for another 40 years, right? I mean, yeah, you're, God you're, willing, it, if I've got that much time. Yeah. Well, I hope so too, man. I think you will. I know you, you take good care of yourself. We didn't get to talk about cycling too much, but we'll have to do that next time. So, but the long-term vision, the hundred year company, I've heard that term used. I think I came from a company, uh, Sun Life, which, you know, they, they consider themselves a hundred year company. They're a very, very old company. What, what is it about that decision to go that route where some people might be lured by, Oh, if I build it to X and the multiples are why that I can sell it for Z, you know, some people get attracted about the ability to exit and move on or retire. So what is it about you that differs in your kind of uh, approach to, to building this thing? I think I get really excited about a, a really long-term vision. Cause like over that long of a time span, you can accomplish so much. Mm-hmm. And that really excites me. And I think that is, that benefits everybody who's at stake internally and externally. Mm-hmm. Uh, as far as like scaling up and exiting, I don't know. Everybody likes stuff to some degree. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to say that doesn't motivate me at all, but every time I've gotten stuff, it wears off Mm -hmm. and then I got to get more stuff. Mm -hmm. And so there's that, but also you get a big check. Like the fire that I have in my belly today, the the excitement that that fuels, the fun that we're having just being scrappy. Yeah. That would all go away if I got a big check. Yeah. So I'd have a big check and have more stuff, but then, then what? Then what? Yeah. Yeah. So, 
to me, that doesn't seem nearly as exciting as like really playing the long game and seeing what we could do with it. That's really cool, man. I'm glad you had that perspective. I, I see that sometimes with athletes, you know, like let's say an athlete works for 15 years in their career and they finally win a championship and they get there and it's like, okay, what's next? You know, some of them it's retirement, they're forced out of it, but the, or the only thing I can do is go try to accomplish and get that feeling again, but they've basically reached the pinnacle. And sometimes you'll hear from athletes and, and other folks, like you reach the pinnacle and then it's like, well, that wasn't exactly what I expected, or I don't feel any different, or I don't have the same fire anymore. But it's interesting that you say that. I do think all stuff that we buy, whether it's houses or cars or toys or jewelry, there's a fleeting moment that that stuff is exciting. And then you wake up the next day and you're just like, well, I'm the same person now mm -hmm. and I got to go do something else. I, I'm, I'm similar to you that I don't think I could ever shut it down. I mean, I may do different stuff over the course of my career, but the notion of like riding off into the sunset with a big check and retiring and then twiddling my thumbs just doesn't appeal to yeah. me. So you th it sounds like early on though, you were telling me way back and I didn't get to say you were kind of a, you weren't a, guy that like to follow rules, I was going to comment on the Flamingo and AR-15 shirt, which is pretty gnarly, oh, by yeah. the way. <laughs> Impulse buy online. <laughs> that, that, suggests, that suggests maybe there, there's not a lot of rule fall in there, but that's a sweet shirt. But I, I'm just hearing about your story and hearing about you. It does seem like whatever you sink your teeth into, you just need to have something to do. Um, and I'm kind of the same way. I can relate to that feeling at all. So as we build this to be a hundred year company, eventually there will be some sort of exit, right? But like, what do you think ultimately, um, if you look back retrospectively in your life, like you would have said, Hey, I've accomplished. Was it, is it uh, just building the factor to be that? Or do you think you'll do other things in your life once you get it to that point where you can remove yourself? I don't really feel like I've accomplished much. I feel like we're just getting started. Mm hmm uh, I mean, we're making good progress, so that you know that's somewhat satisfying. But uh, I don't know. I, I'm just looking forward, uh, probably too far ahead. Uh, I don't look back much, and uh, probably a flaw is I'm not usually very present, present or appreciative of where we're at. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm just focused on like way down the road. Um, so we have a lot to do. Uh, I mean, there's you know we've got a roadmap of a whole bunch of products and services that we want to offer to accomplish our mission of helping these companies grow. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're gonna chip away at those one at a time. And, uh, you know, we'll have some failures. We've already had some failures. Uh, we'll try to do that as cheaply and quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Fail uh, fast, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. So, uh, all right, man. So closing thoughts, we'll go ahead and wrap up the show. I appreciate you joining me, Gabe. And I know this was anybody that listened today that's typically listening to my podcast. Obviously, this is a little bit uh, different than our normal subject matter. But I, I just... I have such a soft spot for entrepreneurs. My father is a construction entrepreneur himself. I've, I interviewed a bunch of them. I just like entrepreneurs, man. And so I appreciate you sharing your story. But what, what, why don't you leave some closing thoughts for the folks that have listened? Uh, anything you want to leave them with, the things to think about or lessons learned, the floor is yours, man. Probably the biggest thing if, you know, anybody who's running a business is uh, develop a really compelling vision for growth. I think when you have a compelling vision for growth, one, it's possible. Two, it's exciting. And I think a lot of the, the, the issues in business, like bad culture, or not being able to find people, uh, a lot of those issues um, really, I don't want to say they go away, but they all get focused uh, toward a common goal. Okay. Um, I see it just a ton of our clients and other businesses where they don't want to dream big enough. Uh, and mm -hmm. they've got a lot of like assumptions of why they shouldn't. But um, I think, I think, Everybody should just stop and say, like, how could I dream bigger? Mm -hmm. Because it's possible. Like, why not? Let's do it. Well, I, I'm with you on that, man. I catch myself every once in a while. We were joking, like, yeah, about, like, Rogan's audience, right? And you, you, you use the term not yet, you know, with your son. Sometimes when he says, I can't do something, you go, well, not yet, right? You have to have that mentality that I'll catch myself sometimes not dreaming big enough. I'm like, well, why is that? Why is that enough? That's that. No, you should go bigger, right? Because I think the loftier your goals are, maybe you don't accomplish exactly that level of loftiness. But if you are, as long as you're dreaming that big and you, you get somewhere short of that, it's probably a lot further than if you just were practical about yeah. your dreams, right? <laughs> so I can echo that. And I really appreciate that, man. And I think if I had to bet on you, I, I, I would bet on uh, your success based on your track record so far and, and obviously your vision of the company. So I wish you well, Gabe. It's been great to get to know you over the last couple of years. And, and thanks for joining me on the show. Thanks for having me. All right, man. True Captive believes in healthcare that is personal, an in insurance that isn't complicated. Check them out at truecaptive.com.